So, uh, continue. Hello, everyone. Today I'm with the lovely Keely Tavener, who's a psychotherapist. And I just wanted to have a quick chat with her about her job um, and what that can bring to um, family clients as well. So, hello, Keely. Hey, Vicky. Good to see you again. We had a wonderful video talking about divorce and a narcissist. We did. The absolutely it's done really well on YouTube and you know I refer my clients who come to me seeking help for relationships with narcissists and most acutely when an individual is divorcing someone who they believe to be narcissistic and the divorce process is particularly difficult for them so I, I want to thank you for our interview as as for me I'm a passionate psychotherapist who specializes in helping empathic people dealing with narcissistic individuals, helping them to understand the dynamics. Because often what happens is people end up stuck researching narcissism, trying to work out why did they, why did they treat me this way? What might I be able to do to make things easier? And often taking disproportionate responsibility. So my role is to help people to understand the dynamics, but also to understand choice, consequence, and you know, in personal empowerment, taking back their power. What made you get into, I mean, it's a particular specialism, isn't it? The empath mm -hmm. and the narcissism work that you do. Mm -hmm. um, what made you get into that, Keely, in the first place? My own relationships. Ah. Absolutely. I had children young, so and found myself in a really difficult predicament once I was pregnant and became vulnerable. Gosh. And so that was incredibly perplexing. And that's where I picked up my first self-help book. Ah. So, yep, I was watching Oprah one day, she's controversial <laughs> at the moment, and uh, it just began to read. And, and the notion throughout the book was personal responsibility. Okay which was quite a revolution for me because I'd felt, and it's not that I wasn't a victim because there were things that were victimizing, but also beginning to kind of look within, look at the choices I was making that actually fueled my sadness, my, my, my miserable state really. And that, that really just massively inspired me to reflect on my life, reflect on where I was going. I was a young mother was more or less single and just wanting better for us and so that led me to go back to education do a degree um, and then I got my first job working in prisons oh wow yeah and and then dealing with personality disordered offenders mm. high risk offenders beginning to understand personality disorder, disorders psychopathy narcissism and that just opened up my world. But yeah, personally, I was still having these one-way relationships, thinking, you know, I'm the good girl. Sometimes being attracted to a bad boy, you have to be, mm -hmm. a, you know, real about that. Yeah. And and I, I guess I was bright enough to begin to work on myself and then realising... Actually, I don't want to become a psychologist like my colleagues. I didn't want to become a forensic psychologist. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wanted to help people like myself who weren't at the further end of the mental health spectrum, mm -hmm. but who found themselves in difficult, intimate relationships where they often gave and didn't understand why perpetually they ended up, just like I did, in these one-way relationships. So... It, it became like fused mm. between growing myself and then thinking actually, yeah, when I qualified as a psychotherapist thinking, well, firstly having to understand, you know, developing a private practice and what yes. that meant. Yeah. And then I just thought, well, I'm just gonna specialize in what my, my pain's been mm. Mm. because I, you know, I know it, I'm obviously much further along than my clients would be. And so it just became this really beautiful marry. I was gonna say, it sounds as though your focus and your drive is to empower people 
actually, to kind of to, to give them back a little bit of control and to feel like they can make decisions. And I think that's where lawyers and psychotherapists and divorce coaches and things like that can really work hand in hand because it it is, as you called it, this marriage, isn't it? Um, to try and uh, to try and give a client back their lives, I guess. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and something I did for myself. Yes. Yeah. So at the time I was, you know, unskilled. I was working on the checkouts at IKEA. Wow. And then, you know, realizing that all the energy I was putting into this relationship, if I could take a smidgen of that back <laughs> to develop myself. Yes. Actually, it, it empowered me. It gave me choice. It gave me different career options. Yes. And that was, you know, just particularly profound for me. That was exactly um it was the way to heal and then you know to get to this privileged position to help other people yeah. go in similar situations I mean it's difficult as a lawyer I see clients quite a lot and it's it's lovely sometimes to watch their journey um you know and and see how they change and develop and and start taking choices for themselves but obviously there are some people that I'm not skilled in any way to be able to deal with what is a psychotherapist Keely? So a psychotherapist, we've trained for four years, usually at a master's level. Okay. Um, and you choose the specialism. So in terms of human psychology, you, well, what I, I, you choose what aspect of psychology really fits for you. So person-centered psychotherapy really spoke to me. Okay. Um, I chose not to do CBT, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what offer my coaches and mentors were encouraging me to yes. do because well then it's clearer for you to get a job Keely you know the yeah. path is much clearer yeah CBT is um, a very big thing isn't it at the moment everybody's kind of oh we'll go for CBT that will really help absolutely and I was really fascinated by a more, much more holistic view of the individual not just thinking and behavior but also you know social status diet class, race, the politics of the time, the history, the way, what time you're born. I was much more interested in the individual as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that person-centered psychotherapy really spoke to me. But I also know it was a risk because the way forward in terms of my career post-qualification was not clear, which no. is why working for myself became, became the natural progression which is not what I signed up for. I just wanted a, a job to rock into. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, by God's grace, I had the courage, the support and the mentorship to really encourage me to, you know, start small. So I was a probation officer. Uh, and okay. Yeah, so I was really equipped yeah. dealing with difficult mm -hmm. um, personalities. So then it was a slow shift from going down to four days at work, one day private practice, and then yes. building up. Uh, I qualified in 2012, and by 2015, I I took a five-year sabbatical. So, ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah. Because I, mean, I suppose as a probation officer, very strict, you're working within the criminal justice system, and now you've got all this freedom to be able to work with a client and, and do what works for them. So I suppose you've got a lot more freedom, haven't you? absolutely absolutely but you have far more responsibility yes yeah, yeah. so there's not it's that not guaranteed me. paycheck so you have to be yes. much more innovative and thinking about how can I help people much more mm. broadly which is why I create a program I have a program called Navigate Narcissism Now where I'm bringing people together more rather than just just one-to-one -one. One -one. okay Talk me through um, a typical journey of a client who started on separation and maybe has received a referral to you from a solicitor or um, from somebody else, a, f a friend or whatever. Talk me through their journey so, so that people can have an idea as to what it looks like. I know it's different in every case, but kind of a, a, a sort of typical um, yeah. journey. So usually sometimes people will find me on TikTok or YouTube and then inbox me or like a friend might say to somebody, I think you need to talk to someone. So as I'm well established now, there's much more referrals through um, word of mouth. Yeah. And then we need just have an initial 15 minute talk. 
and I'll get to understand what's the, the biggest dilemma for people. Okay. And often the dynamics become really clear, even within just that 15 minute talk. And I can work out, well, let's move to a consultation. Yeah. We have an hour together. I'll explore your situation. For example, if someone's separating and how that's beginning to play out. So for some people, they've never spoken to a professional before. Mm. Some people have been told a whole raft of fibs. So they're not quite clear on what their rights are, how to navigate forward. They're kind of often quite isolated and doing the best that they can. A lot of clients who refer have read every book, watched every YouTube, they're very familiar. But in terms of how it really begins to marinate into their own life and how their own histories, the way that they were parented, their regard for themselves, often that can be the missing link. Mm. And that's where I help people to understand how their own personal histories has shaped them. So many, like I said, majority of the clients I work with would score as being highly agreeable, you know, thinking about personality traits, avoid conflict, very giving. And so beginning to marry how attachment, how we were raised, whether our parents were kind or not so kind, did we get our need, basic needs met? So people begin to understand how their current dilemma is fed by their history. And then also, you know, knowing my own limitations. So then potentially in the case of divorce, might be referring to a mediation lawyer, a mediator, a lawyer like yourself, or, or other agencies that can help people to navigate a space that they, they don't understand and may well have often been told untruths. And when you caveat that with also cultural dynamics for people from different parts of the globe, being hypersensitive to culture, race, class, and most importantly, power, because it's not always wise to, you know, speak your truth, helping people to learn how to keep themselves safe, mm. but also to take active steps to, you know, empower them for themselves. Just like, for example, it might be, you know, getting a HR1 form, um, mm. done, not necessarily realizing that, you know, you do have rights. Mm. And just because you've been told that I can sell the house and you won't get anything, yeah. it's not necessarily true. So it's it's unique to every person I come across, but there are most definitely a lot of patterns that emerge, one being people really being in the dark. Mm. I mean, do people find it, I mean, I, I've often heard about um, therapy, um, mm. that it's a really difficult experience and that clients often take kind of a step back. Um, it. Is that the case with you, Keely? How, how do clients find it? Well, I, I think difficult. I think, yeah, well, I, I think just as you mentioned at the beginning, this kind of coach therapy yeah. uh, option. I think people view coaching as where I am, where I want to be. Yeah. Um, and think that they don't have to, you know, focus on aspects, especially if you've had a very traumatic childhood past. Yes. So coaching can often be the aspects that's referred, people prefer that. Future focused, yeah, rather than right. let's hide the things from the past. Absolutely. Yeah. However, your past is in your unconscious. Yeah. It's, it's in your beliefs. It the way you behave, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Mm. So one of the things that shows up why people might refer back to me will be when self-sabotage begins to emerge and they'll be really frustrated with themselves. And that is where, you know, my training in helping people to unpick, which, as I said to people, look, you you may want to avoid aspects of your history, mm. but it's actually in your present because it shows up in your beliefs. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what you think you're avoiding, it's actually sabotaging you, mm. you know, and so, you know, I'm also also really trauma informed as a psychotherapist. And helping people to understand their nervous system, mm. you know, involuntary reactions, mm. you know, making links with health dilemmas, be it high blood pressure, uh, IBS, which is a, a frequently shows up with clients who 
weird feelings, try and sweep things under the rug. So this becomes a, a much more holistic way. Yeah. No, it's amazing, isn't it? I've, I've done um, work with uh, somebody who's a functional medic. Um, and so she does a lot about gut health and things like that. And um, she was saying just how much stress can cause um, the microbes in your stomach to stop working and then you end up with all sorts of health issues health issues and um you know those emotional issues really can physically affect you can't they and yeah and people are at the doctors wanting diagnoses mm. have tests sometimes operations mm. actually it's a psychosomatic issue yeah and, it's, and that and that is, it's a real beautiful way to help people to understand involuntary reactions, why they may have bowel movements at yes. times when they're feeling uncertain or need to go, mm. you know, to the lavatory. <laughs> and, and, you know, so that they begin yeah. to understand their nervous system. And I think combining that with psychoeducation, mm. as well as beginning to dip into inner child wounds, mm. actually, I think people, what I often find is, People become much more curious about themselves, mm. and once they face it, I'm I'm pretty good at putting people at ease, um, and I'm not your stereotypical therapist either. So it's not no. like I'm <laughs> on the couch and I'm sitting there writing notes. Um, but I think You've that got the glasses, me. Keely. You know, come on. <laughs> and I often put my hand on my chin. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's something about you know let's have a conversation let's see what's going on for you mm. just going to be curious mm. so you know though that can also be particularly helpful and for some people they don't want to go there you know mm. some people are asking me for strategy and tips and skills so it really is unique so it's very client driven very yeah. client driven so i mean on average sort of how many sessions can you say is yeah. it sort of a really long piece of work? Is it? I know with CBT, it's very much kind of going in very short term and, and kind of coming out. Um, what about your work? Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say there are political reasons behind the drive for CBT. Yes, of course. Which, um, regarded to be much more cost effective. Often people yes. have come to me after they've had CBT and they're baffled why their coping strategies are no longer you know working which is often yes. well if you're learning to cope it, mm. we need to get to the core issue yeah um so generally i request clients commit to six months okay you know so that they have time for the insights to filter because what we want is that integration between not just knowledge mm. but it begins to filter into your behavior your belief yeah. systems what you're also doing to get out of your comfort zone mm. you know for so many people, uh, self care is regarded as being selfish. Mm. Yes. So, if you were ever given, actually giving back to yourself can be very, very difficult. As, as well as a parent, um, you know, I'm I'm a mother of two. Um, they're they're getting older now, but as a parent, you you put the children first, don't you? You always put the children first, and there, there's almost that pecking order of kids first, and and you kind of, I think the dogs actually first in our house now, but um, it's it was the children first at the time. It's probably now the dog, and the the children are very vocal about that. <laughs> the Absolutely. dog always comes first. The dog always comes first. But then, as a parent, you've kind of you're almost hardwired to not think about yourself and and not to look after yourself and I think it is something that you really need to sort of take time to, to actually engender and the other thing I was going to say is change requires energy and when people are going through a really difficult time they haven't got the energy so it really is getting the building blocks isn't it and it's a so in that sense it's a really tough process that people have to commit to but I think you're living proof of the fact that people can do it and their life will be better as a result. Well, I, I mean, the thing is, I mean, you said, you know, change takes energy. Stuckness takes energy. You see, so the challenge is you're yes. not going yeah. sort to of navigate either way. Yeah. Number one, change, yeah. purposeful, conscious change. Well, mm. as a second, I have no idea of what you may become yeah. when you begin to honour yourself to the tap dancing lessons you may have been denied as a child if your parents only ex wanted you to do academia. So yeah. 
that holds immense untapped potential. Whereas if we stay stuck, mm. well, we can slowly start to make predictions about mm. what will happen to someone. And that's that's quite easy to do. So it's about choice, empowerment, but also being really delicate about how someone's personal unique circumstance yeah. impacts on them. So I'm a big fan of discernment. Mm. You know, that we begin to choose much more wisely and and a massive fan of of starting small mm. so one of the things i'm passionate about is acknowledging our victories yes because from the big picture can be seems so elusive yeah yeah but but what have you managed to do today you know yeah. bringing that victory back being, being kind to yourself um i will say that to my clients you know acknowledge the the little things because oh, that's okay. big from acorns, oak trees grow is one of my favourite expressions. And it's, it's something I probably use every day. And most of my clients, if they're watching this, will probably go, oh, God, here she goes again. But there we go. <laughs> I, I say to my clients, we want to ring that victory. Oh, ah, fantastic. And that, and that might even be having a meal. You know, some of my, my yeah. mom, they'll eat what the kids don't eat. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's like, actually, what about having your own meal with yeah. the children? Yeah. Small wins that we... We wouldn't yeah. even notice. And that builds momentum. Yes. Plus yeah. having a community of like-minded people yeah. who get it. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, Keely. I was I was going to ask a question, but I think actually it's probably a bit trite now. But if there was one piece of advice that you could give somebody going through the um separation divorce journey, what would it be? Get yeah, professional help. Okay. Yeah, okay. a lot of hearsay, a lot of have you done this? Have you, yeah. Um, and I know, you know, it, it can be challenging, the finances, the, find a way. I believe we are a creative uh, a creative species. Mm. And there's, us there's usually a way. There's usually a way. Get the advice and then, you know, seek professional help. Get informed so you have clarity about the way forward and then day by day. Lovely. Thanks ever so much, Keely. We will be putting um, your details in our um, links so um, people can get in touch with you if they, they need to. But it's been lovely um, to talk to you again and fascinating, as usual. <laughs> right. Take care of yourself, Vicky. Keep doing your brave work. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.